year is 1967 and Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin are on the hunt. Now this isn't a typical hunt you'd think of where they're hunting a deer or bear or, or even turkey. This is unusual because they are hunting for something even more wild. It's also not a typical hunt that you'd think of in the fact that what they're hunting for they're not even trying to kill but rather just see. See they are hunting for Bigfoot. Now, at this point in time, there wasn't really a large following in the Bigfoot belief community. Most people that believed in Bigfoot only believed in him because of ancient texts and drawings of, of this wild, hairy man that legends have told about. So, riding through Bluff Creek, California, Roger Patterson, with his 16 millimeter Kodak camera in his saddlebag and Bob Gimlin close behind him, went on this hunt. As they got to a point in the trail, their horses became very, very uneasy, and they started to kick in fear. And it was at that moment they saw her. Quickly, Roger Patterson jumped off his horse, reached into his saddlebag to grab his camera, and he began running toward this bipedal beast trying to record it. The camera work is very shaky and uneasy as he's running, trying to stabilize the shot with Bob Gimlin right behind him. Patterson captured this film which would later be known as the Patterson-Gimlin film. In this short video, it's only 56 seconds in entirety, you see a large, hairy, bipedal beast walking through the woods. It turns, pauses, gives that infamous glance, and then walks off. Right after the beast had, had gone far off, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin headed back to their campsite. There they grabbed some plaster so that they could cast the footprints of this large beast that they believed was Bigfoot. Now, after this came out, it was huge. It was breaking news. Newspapers reported on it, and then mainstream media got a hold of it. Bigfoot was everywhere. TV shows, movies, comic books. It was in kids' coloring books. They made toys. This was a national icon, and even to this day, Bigfoot is everywhere. What Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin didn't realize is their film that day and it's 56 seconds in entirety, sparked a wildfire. This film has since been known as the greatest evidence we have to the existence of Bigfoot. So that brings us to today, 2022. With all of the technology that we have, drones, satellites, thermal optics, we still haven't found or even received a video that is clearly evident as the one shot in 1967. You're telling me with all of this technology, there's still no video proof of Bigfoot. Do people really still believe that Bigfoot is out there? Well, the answer is yes. My team and I had the privilege of going down to Michigan in a tiny little town called West Branch. It is known as the Bigfoot capital of Michigan. What we did there is we attended Bigfoot days. We were able to attend and document this full day event where people throughout the state of Michigan and parts of the Midwest came and they listened and shared stories about their experiences with Bigfoot. They even were able to hear from some people who have dedicated large parts of their life to the hunt and discovery of Bigfoot. When you combine thousands of eyewitness accounts that are very consistent, Native American legends all over the continent to talk about a big, hairy, wild man. The Patterson-Gimlin film, which is really the only really convincing film footage we have. The footprint evidence. There have been hundreds of casts made of footprint impressions that are very consistent. And things that look like Bigfoot actually did exist in the fossil record. They were yeah. called hominins, and for two million years in Africa, they were basically upright walking apes. They weren't as tall as Bigfoot. That was the only thing that doesn't really match up with the modern sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. So if you consider all of that, it's actually, in my opinion at least, that's a pretty compelling body of evidence. The fact that I, I feel myself as a, a relatively intelligent person, well-educated, I kind of had to believe myself, believe my own gut, that there was something honest and true about it. I'm 100% convinced that they're out there. 
I've been studying this for going on 14 years. I've read 106 Bigfoot books, probably got 500 to go. I've been investigating for decades and I've been publishing my newsletter for almost a quarter of a century. I'm Daniel Perez, uh, age 58, born and raised in Southern California, the Los Angeles area. Thank you all for coming out. It's an honor to be here at the uh, at this event. Uh, always happy to commune with my fellow Bigfoot enthusiasts around the country. Um, yeah, so my name's Ken Gerhard. I'm a cryptozoologist. Ken Gerhard is a widely recognized cryptozoologist, an author and a lecturer. In addition, he has written six books on the subject of unknown animals. His research has been featured on numerous TV shows, including Missing in Alaska, Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, America on Earth, The Unexplained, and Legend Hunters. My occupation since 1985 as a professional work has been a union licensed electrician. I'm still in that occupation and I'm not retired, so we work in the field. We build uh, little buildings that you've probably never heard of, like Apple, Microsoft, Google. We do those. Sooner or later, you'll hear about those companies. All right, we're here with Doug, and we are, again, we're at uh, Bigfoot Days out here in West Branch. I'm up to about 145 incidents now. I, I keep getting more. Every once in a while, somebody call me and say, hey, this is what happened to me. and and. Uh, uh, I like to get them to write it out. I think it's important to document sightings because then you have a history. Phil Shaw has lived in West Branch since 1972. His first interest in Bigfoot came in 2006 when he and his wife saw a probable Bigfoot in New Brunswick on a trip to the Maritime Provinces. I just want to ask you why you believe in Bigfoot and kind of what started your belief in Bigfoot. Okay. Well, as everybody probably watched some of the shows and all in the past, I grew up in the 70s, so there was a lot of movies to watch. And uh, so I got out in the woods more, and then eventually I just had where there's more experiences, like noises and things you heard, and like the howls you hear. And then with the internet came out, there's just a wealth of information. I heard sounds when I used to come up with my wife to my father-in-law's place. And I used to hear callings because we sit at the fire at night. And then one night, uh, there was a big slap on the on my house, and so that's my encounters with Bigfoot. Eric Salaji has had a lifelong curiosity of all things strange and unusual. Uh, he has had an early obsession in his life with UFOs, Bigfoot, and some uh, personal experiences that he's had with paranormal activity has fueled his passion for higher strangeness. My first experience with it was um, pretty much seeing a, a photographic still from the Patterson Gimlin film right. in, a, in a library book and um, I don't know it just it nothing ever looked fake about it to me and then flash forward to uh, uh, 1977 that would have put me at 12 years old uh, in search of with Leonard Nimoy um, they actually showed the Patterson Gimlin film and it's you know 36 second entirety or whatever it was, maybe 56 seconds. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, that's a guy in a costume. And when I looked at it, even though it was at the time that there was no stabilization or anything like that. So what you saw was literally him jumping off the horse, running, trying to find some place to prop the camera up and then finally get a, a couple of seconds of steady camera footage. Um, there was just never anything about it that to me did not look organic. It, it just always felt true to me. I would oftentimes look at the newspaper and every once in a while there would be a, there was no internet back then, there would be a newspaper article about Bigfoot and I would take my scissors and cut it out and we shopped our shoes at JCPenney, remember that store? And so I had a shoe box, so that was my first filing cabinet. I started putting those in a shoe box, my newspaper clippings. And so at this point, in terms of uh, my physical files, they are the largest in the world, period, flat out. There's nobody that has bigger physical files in the world than me. Ken, when did you start 
when was your first belief in Bigfoot? When did that kind of pique your interest and when did you first start to believe in Bigfoot? Well, first of all, I'd like to clarify that um, belief is not a thing with me personally because I try to approach this from a scientific perspective. And in science, belief implies that you basically want something to be real. You know, it's more of an emotional attachment. So what I tell people is that I'm 90% convinced that Bigfoot exists based on 45 years of research all over the continent, working with all the leading investigators, interviewing hundreds of eyewitnesses, uh, and I've never seen one with my own eyes, which is why I tell people I'm 90% convinced, because that's a scientific way to look at it. There's always a, a margin of error. Everybody loves Bigfoot. It's a monster, and maybe it's an unknown animal. It kind of combines everything that I love. In my opinion, Bigfoot or Sasquatch can get to be about nine feet tall. It has a body that is mostly covered in hair, except for the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and usually eyewitnesses say there's not much hair up here, up on the top of the nose, the bridge of the nose, and under the eyes. Keep searching, baby. Stop, and you know what? Yeah, I wake up, I'm alive, so I'm going. Find my place to thrive and survive. They can think I'm alive, you know I'm golden. In the grass, so tall, I gotta hide. Passing Patty in the parking lot, she wanna ride. Those my only skin I can see is around her eyes. But like her, all legends must die. So go ahead, keep snapping your cam. Keep playing that tune, give me all that you can. Being rude is not a part of my plan. Well, I guess unless I'm hungry, then I gotta show you fool. So I am. So if you say that you see me, then you're one of the few. If you still don't believe, I got something for you. You can step into my home, but it might get ugly. Stay away from my door and I'll remain the unseen. Unseen, unseen. I'm the thing of a dream. I'm creeping around the woods in the evergreen. So you tried to snap a pic for your magazine. Don't get too close, I'll make your children scream. I'm big, I'm scary, I'm truly a freak. I'm a different kind of beast with a different technique. I'm quiet, invisible, so unique. If you saw me up close, you'd simply shriek. Leave me alone and let me be. Cause I don't wanna see you, why do you wanna see me? From Cali to Florida to Tennessee, I'm the king of the woods and I remain unseen. Within the Bigfoot community, I'm what is known as an aper, okay. which basically means that I am, if Bigfoot exists, I think it's a hominin, which is a great ape. Okay. And that has, it has, basically it has a similar locomotor system to us, that is it walks upright, primarily on its hind legs, which mm -hmm. makes it look very human. But as far as the physical characteristics that are described, covered in hair, ape-like features, receding forehead, sagittal crest, powerfully built, it's an ape. And that's, that's my opinion. I think it's easy to look at something that stands up on two legs, walks on two feet, and even though they might hunch over, or their long, arms might be longer, and their, their head is lower set on the neck, you still want to assign human attributes to it because it looks like it walks like us. Right. Um, if you watch a bear, a bear can walk upright, yeah. but a bear doesn't have really long arms, and it kind of waddles more than it has strides and these things are said to have a very smooth stride to them almost to the point where they almost look like they're on roller skates or on skis because you don't see any kind of head bob and it, it's just a very unnerving way that they move so um, I think I think they're more closely related to us I don't think they're a um, I don't think they're a close relative but I think they're more us than than ape our best guess for the moment is it's a primate like us because we are primates and I would just leave it at that because if you were to go further down the road or farther down the road it's just a guessing game. If you were to say it's an ape, part of the ape group, part, part of the human species, that's your guessing. And I would say just, just until that time comes the best answer is to say I don't know or more than likely it's just a primate that's in the group that we're in. And that should be enough. Uh, in terms of my book and my presentations, it's kind of respectfully pushed back against a lot of the misinformation that's out there. And unfortunately, one of the uh, 
one of the failings of this great world we live in with this social media and instant communication is there's just a ton of bad information out there about Bigfoot on different podcasts and things and people just make things up. Most people, when you have that conversation at the restaurant, the sidewalk, or at your neighbor's place, you go, I believe in Bigfoot, I don't believe in Bigfoot. You know, that's, you might be talking to your neighbor and this is, I've seen one, I believe in it, and your neighbor might say, you know what, I've lived here all my life too, I don't believe it. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't, that, that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? What would you I say, say to read them? a book, dang it, pick a book. <laughs> Almost any Bigfoot book. Uh, you know, there's some are better. Dr. Meldrum's book, Sasquatch, or uh, Legend Meets Science, probably one of the better ones. But, you know, for people to be so positive about something and not make any effort to study it, and I really don't care if they believe, but don't be so darn positive unless you're willing to read a book about it and study it. Only 18% of the general population thinks Bigfoot might exist. I'm confident they're out there, but it's just like, I would like to see one, I haven't, but you know, seeing one would be, again, it would reinforce your idea that you already have. Always carry a good camera, and if you think they're in the area, take a look. I actually, a lot of people have cell phones today, prefer a camera that you can document. I figured I got 18 power zoom on that thing. I've never had a Bigfoot sighting, so I tell people I'm not 100% convinced it exists, I'm 90% convinced. After Rene DeHinden died in 2001, there was a lot more study on the film by Bill Munns and some other people and some other studies that actually freelancers that have posted stuff up on YouTube that are making these points about the subject in the film and it just all the information I'm seeing it just it just it made me completely sold on the idea that the PG film is 100% real and if the PG film is real then Bigfoot is out there part of it is the you know the number of stories out there of things that correspond with all the books I've read if they're biblical actually Esau and the Edomites, Genesis 25, uh, the twin brothers, the all hairy red man like uh, Esau was, if he in fact mixed with the giants, the Nephilim, you've got a, you've got a, a, a being there, you know, it's just, it's a biblical reference, no proof, but uh, just the same, I think it's a great possible heritage. There's another shot of John Green, uh, September of 2003 in Willow Creek, California. So he gave a very good presentation there talking about his life work. And he basically summarized that we should continue on uh, in spite of the fact that we have no proof that Bigfoot is real, but to continue on 